welcome again to my back garden where we're going to look at another very simple mechanical oscillator. This time it's not going to involve springs and masses, we're going to look at strings and masses and we're going to look at this which is the simple pendulum. Now in physics a simple pendulum is a light inextensible string with a point mass on the end of it. Now obviously um, we've got to approximate the point mass with something that's relatively small and dense and so this metal object uh, will do for that and our light inextensible string is a string that has no mass hence light and inextensible means that it will not stretch no matter what the tension in the string is. Now this simple device first came to the attention of physicists back at the end of the 1500s or early 1600s, the date isn't quite precise, when a chap you may have heard of called Galileo was sitting in a church service in Pisa Cathedral. And fortunately for us and for all of science, the church service was clearly not that riveting because he noticed during the church service that they had these huge chandeliers that were hung on long chains from the very high ceiling of the cathedral and they were swinging backwards and forwards. Now, the chandeliers were apparently dragged to one side to light them, um, but also these large medieval cathedrals were rather drafty and so sometimes they could also catch the wind. But for whatever reason, this chandelier was swinging backwards and forwards and it attracted Galileo's attention. And timing it with his pulse, uh, which is not normally a very accurate means to time things, but he timed it with his pulse and what he claimed was that the period of the chandelier, the pendulum, the period of the chandelier was independent of the amplitude of the motion, which is a characteristic of simple harmonic oscillators. So, was Galileo right? Well, let's delve in and apply Newton's second law to this system and have a look in detail to find out whether this is in fact true. We've seen a simple pendulum in action now. What we're going to do is look at it in detail and determine whether it's a simple harmonic oscillator. So we're going to do exactly what we did with the simple mass spring system. We look at the forces acting on the mass and we apply Newton's second law. So we're going to apply Newton's second law. The decision we have to make in what direction are we going to apply it? Well, Unlike a mass on a spring, which moves in a line, we've now got a mass on the end of this string, which moves in a circular arc. Now, we want to get rid of the tension. We don't want to have to worry about this tension force because we don't know what it is. So what we're going to do is we're going to look in the tangential direction. So this is the direction that is parallel to a tangent of the circle uh, which the mass is moving along. So when we do that, we're going to take this direction here as positive, and Newton's second law is, of course, force equals mass times acceleration. So the force that's acting in the tangential direction is going to be the component of this weight here, so this force mg. So if you look at this right angle triangle here, we want this component of the force that I've just drawn in. This angle here is theta, and so the length of this side is mg times sine of theta. So all we've done here is resolve the force to get the component of the weight that is parallel to the tangent, but the weight, the component of the weight that's uh, parallel to the tangent is acting in this direction, which is the opposite to positive, so we put a minus sign in front of it. And then we have e equal to the mass and the acceleration, uh, when we had the mass spring system, was just x times uh, uh, the second order derivative of x, so x double dot. Here, our displacement is the length of this arc, s. And so instead of x, we have s double dot, because this is the linear displacement of the mass. Now, the first simplification we can make is we can cancel out the m's, but the problem we've got here is that we've got two variables. We've got a theta on this side, and we've got the arc length s, and as the mass moves, you can see that both s 
and theta change, but obviously they're going to change together in unison. There's a relationship between them. So although we've got two variables, theta and s here, we can uh, uh, get rid of one of them by understanding the relationship between the two of them. So to do that, what we need to do is look at the definition of the angle theta. So by definition, theta is equal to the arc length that is corresponding to theta, so that's s, divided by the radius of the circle, right? So this is theta in radians, and this is essentially by definition um, of radians. So if we rearrange this, we get that s is equal to l times theta. Now s here and theta are the two variables. So if we differentiate this with respect to time, L here is a constant. So if I differentiate it with respect to time, I get S dot, that's ds by dt, is equal to L times theta dot, which is d theta by dt. And then if I differentiate it a second time, I get S double dot is equal to L times theta double dot. And that's what I need to put into our equation of motion that we've got here. So if I do that, uh, what I'm going to have is L times theta double dot, because this is S double dot, is equal to minus G times the sine of theta. And so with a little bit more rearranging here, I get uh, theta double dot is minus G over L times the sine of theta. Now we have a problem, because the equation we wanted to get, or hoped we would get, for a simple harmonic oscillator looks like this. Now obviously here we've got theta as our variable instead of x. Uh, g over L is a constant, just like omega squared, so this is good, this is good, this is a problem, right? Here we have the sine of theta, but what we need is actually just theta. So how are we going to make this work? Well, to do that, we need to understand what happens at small values of theta, and we're going to look at the small angle approximation. Okay, so to understand what happens when we have a small value of our angle theta, let's have a look at this diagram here. So what we've got here is we've got a arc that's AC, uh, is an arc, and we've got AB that's a half chord. And if we look at this half chord here, this line AB, we can see that this is 90 degrees, so we've got a right angle triangle, and so AB is equal to just R times the sine of theta. And that's just looking at this right angle triangle here, where we've got angle theta here, and R is the hypotenuse. This is R sine theta. AC, which is an arc, by definition, just as we've dealt with with our simple uh, pendulum just before this, uh, we have that AC is just R times theta, because theta, by definition, is the arc length AC divided by the radius R. Now, Supposing theta gets small, so let's look at the limit uh, where theta goes to zero. So as theta gets smaller, this point A is going to move around the circle here and get closer and closer to C. So if we have a look at what happens when it's at this distance, I want to draw in the half chord AB, and so if I try and do that, I'm going to end up with something like this. So within the resolution that I can draw this, you can see that by the time theta has got this small, there is basically almost no difference between uh, the, the half chord and the arc length. And of course, in the limit that it becomes zero, there literally is no difference between these two lengths. So in this limit where theta is tending towards zero, then the half chord AB will become approximately equal to AC, or in fact, it'll actually become equal in this limit where theta is, is zero. So if we have a small angle theta, so if theta is small, and here, remember, we're doing it in radians, 
right? And the reason we're doing it in radians is because this formula here only works when you're dealing with theta in radians. So if we have a small theta when we're measuring it in radians, then what this means is that r times theta will be approximately equal to r times the sine of theta, and you can cancel out r, and we end up with this small angle approximation for small values of theta, that theta is approximately equal to sine theta. Now, this is the geometric argument. Um, if you happen to know power series, and you can do a power series expansion for sine theta, um, then you should be able to very quickly see, by just discarding the higher order terms, that for small values of theta, you will end up with this same result from the power series. But here we've done a geometric argument that I hope um, everybody can understand. Here we are back at our simple pendulum again, and we've got the equation of motion written at the top that we just arrived. And now, here's where we're going to do a little bit of approximation. So we're going to make the approximation that theta is small. And if we do that, as we've just proven, theta here will be approximately equal to sine theta, and so we can rewrite this equation that theta double dot is equal to minus g over l times theta. Remember, and this is only true for small values of theta. Now, if we look at this and compare it to our simple harmonic oscillator equation, we're going to have a lot happier outcome. Obviously, our, angle, our, our variable here is an angle theta. It's not a linear displacement x. Um, but we have the second order derivative with respect to time, d2 theta by dt squared, or theta double dot on this side. g and l are constants, so we have a constant omega squared term here. And now we no longer have this sine theta term. We just have theta, which corresponds to our variable x. So this is a differential equation that we know how to solve. We can write down the function of theta with respect to time that is the solution to this because we've done it so many times with our mass spring system. So theta as a function of time is just a times the cosine of omega t plus phi. And a here now is the amplitude of the motion and it's measured in radians. It's no longer a linear displacement because we have an angular system here. So the amplitude of a pendulum is measured in uh, an angle. It's not a linear displacement. And omega here, we can just write, you know, see straight off this comparison here, that omega is just the square root of g over l. So this tells us that the frequency of the pendulum will increase with the gravitational field increasing, and it will decrease for an increasing length. So in other words, the frequency of a long pendulum is less than the frequency of a short pendulum. And phi here is just the initial phase. It's not a physical angle, right? So we've now got two angles here, which is sort of can be confusing. We have the phase angle, which is this omega t plus phi, and phi being the initial phase angle. And then we have the physical angle, theta, which is the angle between the string and the vertical. And these are two separate things, and they're not uh, directly related to one another. There isn't a physical phase angle for a pendulum, right? Omega t plus phi is not equal to theta, right? That's a mistake that, that some people make. It's not the same thing. So we've got our solution, but there is a caveat. Remember, we required theta to be small, and the maximum value of theta is this a here, which is the amplitude. So this only applies if we have a small amplitude oscillation. Right? It does not work if we have a large amplitude oscillation, because then, if we have a large amplitude, theta is not always going to be small, and this approximation here will not work. So, for a pendulum, we have a simple harmonic oscillator for small amplitude oscillations only. So now we've looked at the detailed derivation, we can see that Galileo actually didn't quite get it correct. The period of this pendulum does depend on the amplitude because we had that sine term. However, like many things in physics, 
including in fact the entire of Newtonian mechanics, we can make a very good approximation. Newtonian mechanics itself is an approximation of what really goes on. At high energy we have to use relativity and at very small scales we have to use quantum mechanics, but for everyday scales Newtonian mechanics is a really good approximation. So in the case of the pendulum, provided our amplitude is less than say about 10 degrees roughly, then we get a very, very good approximation of simple harmonic motion. And we can also show that the relationship between the length of the pendulum and the period is also, at least in a qualitative fashion, uh, what we derived. So here we can see it for a long pendulum. If I shorten the length, you can see that the frequency has increased, the period has decreased, which is exactly what we would have expected in a qualitative fashion from the formula we derived. Now, despite the fact that this is an approximation of simple harmonic motion, this simple device gave us the best way, most best and most accurate way to measure time um, that was, in fact, still used to provide national time standards up until the early 1900s. And the first person who realized that a pendulum could be used to keep time was, in fact, Galileo himself, who came up with a design for a pendulum clock. However, he unfortunately died before he could build it. He passed the design to his son, who also died before he could build it, proving that building a pendulum clock was perhaps a bit of a hazardous profession. And the first person who actually built a pendulum clock independently was Christian Huygens, who we'll learn about more when we talk about waves, who was a Dutch physicist who invented the pendulum clock in 1656. So this simple device has allowed us to keep time for about three centuries and only recently was superseded by more accurate atomic clocks. So the physics of oscillations is very important for everyday life, even if it doesn't always appear so.